Eric Alterman is a distinguished professor of English and journalism at Brooklyn College and CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, a columnist for The Nation, and the author of many books, including The Promise of Bruce Springsteen. Peter Ames Carlin is journalist, critic, and author of several books, including a comprehensive biography of Bruce Springsteen simply titled Bruce. And Jefferson Cowie is an associate professor of history at Cornell University, author of many books and essays, including Fandom, Faith, and Bruce Springsteen, and Dead Man's Town, Born in the USA, Social History, and Working Class Identity. Welcome to the Soapbox, Eric, Peter, and Jeff. Thank you. Thanks. Did we uh, get the title of my book right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, I have to say, Eric, the way it's laid out on the cover of the book is a little bit confusing, because on the spine... Called, um, I know, uh, fine, but it's called It Ain't No Sin to Be Glad You're Alive. Okay. Colon, the right. Promise of Bruce gotcha. Okay, because on the spine it says The Promise of Bruce Springsteen by Eric what Alterman. <laughs> <laughs> it Ain't No Sin to Be Glad You're Alive by uh, Eric Alterman. Fantastic biography of uh, Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> okay, so... Um, Bruce Springsteen is an artist not unlike other iconic musicians such as the Grateful Dead and Pearl Jam in that he inspires an unusual degree of devotion among his fans. However, even among other artists such as Pearl Jam that occasionally wade into the frothy waters of national politics, Springsteen is perhaps alone in the degree to which his commercial identity is seemingly inextricably bound up with the class and political perceptions of him. He even went as far as to openly and enthusiastically campaign for Democratic presidential candidates John Kerry in 2004 and Barack Obama in 2008. Chris Borick, professor of political science at Pennsylvania's Muhlenberg College, has said Springsteen has consistently utilized both symbols and language that are widely embraced by American conservatives, thus mitigating much of the polarizing effects that his art might otherwise produce. From his focus on the honor of hard work to his utilization of the average man as a working class hero, Springsteen employs, uh, mes employs messages that are rife with conservative overtones. Peter, you have spoken to the man himself. What is your understanding of how Springsteen conceives of his own politics? I mean, I think for him, it's just, uh, you know, it, it, it was an experiential thing. I mean, it was just growing up as a poor kid. And having working class parents, and particularly a father who was, you know, sort of constantly being tossed beneath the wheels of, you know, of of of, of capitalism and 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 economic progress, uh, and so I think, um, you know, that his kind of New Deal type of 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 you know progressive American politics is consistent with with, you know, that experience and and understanding exactly how precarious. So many people in our country are, you know, at, at any given moment, um, and so uh, you know, I think it's just a very natural extension of who he's always been. So uh, I couldn't find anything online detailing the demographics of Springsteen's fan base, but um, I think that there are some some I, I suspect that there are some interesting sort of components to it. For example, I wouldn't be at all surprised to discover that there's a significant number of white working class men among his fan, ba fan base, uh, who more likely than not vote Republican. Um, so, Jeff, c can you talk to that contradiction of, uh, you know, what, what, are these, what are these fans potentially missing in, in Bruce's message, if anything, um, and are they right to sort of wet themselves to uh, th this iconic image that Bruce is projecting uh, that is a populist and working class image? You know, I, I, I think it's, it's interesting because, I mean, he's, he's mostly speaking in an American idiom more than a political idiom, I think. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that, that opens up a wide field of possible interpretations. And I think, and I think he's so invested in being Bruce Springsteen that, he, that, that he's sometimes afraid to actually challenge uh, his audiences politically. I mean, you know, coming out for John Kerry is not exactly a, you know, a, a radical stance, but it... Um, but the uh, I think ultimately, if you if you look at it, uh, he's a social artist, not a political artist. He's bringing people together in the performance venue, mm -hmm. and that's really his 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 major contribution. I think he would he would even possibly say as much explicitly that that his his politics are in the in the concert hall where he creates a congregation more than it is, uh, you know, getting out there and strumming for Kerry or Obama. 
Well, and Eric, you know, he, he seems to uh, come from that, as, as Peter alluded to, that sort of New Deal liberal conception of uh, sort of the Democratic Party, but, but and also from a time when the Democratic Party was representative of working people's interests in a way that they arguably are not at this point. So I think there was a time when the working class uh, portion of his fan base would have pretty safely been described as uh, liberal and and uh, democratic. But of course, either the, the white working class abandoned the Democratic Party or the Democratic Party abandoned the white working class, depending on your perspective. Um, what's, what's your sense of of that question of which abandoned which, the Democratic leaving the working class or working class leaving the Democratic Party? I think the question is fatally flawed. Okay. <laughs> seems and apparently. I have a, I have a um, Pavlovian reaction to the word seems where I quote Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 2. Seems, madam, nay it is, I know not seems. You're saying that because there's a declining percentage of white working class voters in the Democratic Party, Bruce Springsteen is speaking to an audience that declines to agree with him on politics. Yet there's no evidence for that. Um, the, there, there's, there's millions and millions of white working class people, particularly white working class men, who vote for Democrats. There are just fewer of them that vote for Republicans. I've never seen, with the exception of 41 shots, which was misunderstood by the audience that booed it. Mm -hmm. I've never seen any political dissent with regard to Springsteen from his fan base, ever. Uh, you can see it a lot at Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young when they were um, touring uh, against the war, and a lot of people went to those shows wanting to hear Teach Your Children and were furious, and they made a movie about that. They were kind of proud of that. But there's, there's just no evidence for this. Yeah, Springsteen's, Springsteen's not that popular in the South. Maybe Peter can correct me on this. And that's really where the conservative white working class is located. And that's where you might get some pushback. But again, the audience is self-selecting, and those people can go to, you know, Leonard Skinner revival concerts if they want. Mm -hmm. So well, I just don't see... I mean, I think Springsteen took a very small risk. Uh, I agree with Jeff. Springsteen took a, a, a rather minor risk when he came out for Kerry, less so when he came out for Obama. Um, Merle Haggard came out for Obama. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, good point. The Lubin brothers came out for Obama. Um, so, so he took a very small risk because some of his audience wasn't going to like Obama, I mean, like Kerry, but by that time they knew who he was. He had identified himself with this, uh, as we've said, New, New Deal strain of American politics. And, you know, people can get over it. People are complicated. They can hold two or three ideas in their head at, at one time. They can enjoy the music and disagree with the politics. Jeff, did you have something to add to that? I, I was just going to push Eric on that and say, do you think uh, Springsteen actually challenges his audience politically? Well, again, we don't, Jeff, you're, 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 you're a real historian. We don't have any data on the audience. We don't know. Um, well, but we, yeah. have, we have Springsteen's catalog, right? And so we can we can look at that and ask, uh, sort of like what Jeff was alluding to before: Is he really pushing his audience to think critically? And actually, Eric, you have um, uh, some excerpts from your book where you you uh, you make it clear that he's not really challenging the system in his lyrics. He's just more sort of identifying problems of of repression. Um, well, I don't think that's entirely fair. Here, here's how I would say he's challenged his audience. First of all. After my book, uh, that song on the rising told from the perspective of the suicide bomber. Uh, that, that's challenging the audience at that moment in time, no question. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, if you take, like, Tom Chode, he's speaking from the margins of American politics at, at that moment, again, at that moment in history. He's speaking for the people who are to the left of the Clinton administration. He's saying these are the people who are forgotten in a Democratic, pol a Democratic Party center-left politics. Um, he's, not, you know, he's not saying let's overthrow the system, but again, as you said, he's speaking as an artist. He's not speaking as a politician. But yeah, I think those songs where he's asking for, you know, he's, he's writing from the perspective of um, illegal or undocumented uh, migrant, work migrant workers, I, I think there's some challenge asking people to identify 
with a Vietnamese fisherman in, in Texas. Yeah, I think there's some challenges involved in that. I mean, I think a song like We Take Care of Our Own was, was in, its, in its way uh, quite challenging as well. I mean, I think that the writing, I mean, I think he was going for a kind of nuance that ultimately confused virtually everyone. Because obviously, the, you know, the chorus, it's, it's the same as in Born in the USA, where the mm -hmm. chorus seems to be this grand affirmation, but every word of the verses contradicts the chorus. And so, you know, but most people, I think most casual listeners or whatever, tend to go with, you know, what they're hearing repeated again and again. But, uh, but We Take Care of Our Own was essentially, uh, you know, a, a, re you know, a, a pretty severe um, refutation and, you know, a denouncement of, of, of the Bush administration and, and the war and, and basically this mythological notion that America is this, this you know, this kind and gentle uh, self-sustaining community when actually, uh, you know, as he says, the <laughs> mixing metaphors you know, the road of good intentions has gone dry as a bone, you know. <laughs> I don't quite know how he got that that that, that line. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. Uh, this is Jeff. Uh, uh, do you see him changing from a more individualistic approach to a more collective vision in his politics from the 70s to the to the present day? I think he's always been. Uh, I, I think that's been kind of a consistent thing for him. I mean, in, in every stretch. I mean, if you go back to the Wild and the Innocent uh, and the E Street Shuffle, that's all about uh, community experience. I mean, which in that, you know, in that song, at least in the title track, uh, E Street Shuffle is 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 you know sort of represented by the image of the band and 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 the connection between the band and the audience. Um, and I, but I think that that you know that's how he saw things at that point you know in his life. But I think that 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 vision, that idea of people adding up to more than the sum of the parts, and you know that that has maintained consistent throughout his career. I mean, I think he was focused even on darkness and uh, and on Born to Run. He's got there's a sort of sort of brave individual type of character. But but you know but but that character in some ways I mean he explores that character and finds a lot of darkness in there. If you think about the guy at the end of in the song "Darkness on the Edge of Town," you know he's on top at the end, but he's a desperado. You know mm -hmm. he's by himself and he's questioning very obviously questioning you know the validity or the utility of being that sort of fiercely independent struggling guy. You but know? You, you, yeah, and I I, I absolutely. Agree. Although, what I think the connecting it back to the discussion about the wild and the innocent, the street shuffle, and the band, the band and the performance space is how you transcend that right. that alienation and that that desperation of somebody like Darkness and uh, the characters, all the characters in Darkness, really. Um, and, and it's almost like there's always two albums. There's the one you listen to alone in the dark, and then there's the one where you have the transcendent moment in the in the in the stadium. With the fans and with Bruce, uh, sort of leading a uh, a revival. Yeah, Jeff, if I can jump in there, actually, in Eric's book, he he speaks directly to that. He says to fans, Bruce allowed the band uh, the band to fans the band symbolized the subject matter of the Springsteen canon: trust, loyalty, friendship, community, the ownership uh, or the power of companionship. And so it's the sense of shared community and solidarity and even shared ownership over the rock experience, like you say, that sort of transcends uh, the limitations of sort of that lone desperado figure that we see at the end of darkness. And he does, you know, getting back to an earlier question, um, I think he does challenge the audience um, continually, in fact. I mean, I think, you know, Nebraska is a huge challenge just in terms of identifying so closely with... <laughs> You know Charles Starkweather, you know among others, and and Johnny Ninety Nine, all these desperate characters who were doing kind of you know wicked things, but being pushed to this point where you know as is said repeatedly on that album, um, you know I had debts no honest man can pay. You know something pushes you there. You don't you know get there by yourself. Um, you know, and I think that a lot of the things that he's had to say on the albums, I mean, I think he forces his characters and their situations force people to make a decision. I mean, if you want to talk about completely unchallenging uh, political songs or quasi-political songs in the rock and pop canon, uh, you know, just think about Michael Jackson and We Are the World, you know, where the great challenge is to 
look in the mirror and make the world a better place. I mean, what the, or Billy yeah. Joel, we didn't start the fire. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> what I have to say. Good history, though. <laughs> I, I, I kind of feel like I, I started this fire on whether he's challenging us. And I, I wanted to clarify what I was saying about that. And that is, uh, I don't think he's challenging in an overtly political way. I mm-hmm. think he's very challenging as a social artist. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that he, I think he keeps his politics, which I actually, you know, I think are probably pretty, pretty far, pretty, pretty progressive. I think he keeps those under wraps. Uh, uh, and lets his art speak, and that's why I think his his challenges as an artist, but not as a political figure, and and probably as it should be, because if you look at people who have become overtly political in their music, they become terrible. I mean, look what happened to you know like a Steve Earle or Phil Oaks or whatever. They're just not that interesting anymore. <laughs> well, you get to, but I mean, but on the the Magic tour in in two thousand and and eight, uh, in two thousand and seven. He'd sit up there, uh, you know, part of his raps to, to introduce a couple of those new songs were about basically uh, line by line elements of the Patriot Act that he was mm. taking, you know, that he was basically telling his audience were, were wrong and morally, you know, morally wrong. Mm-hmm. Calling them out line by line, you know, the whole idea of, you know, be, you know, the, the you know, what was going on at, at uh, Guantanamo and, and how people were being swept up and held in prison without charges and, you know, that, that these things were un-American and he was, you know, and it was a very specific, you know, based in policy type of type of speech. Well, I think, you know, some people, perhaps even including Springsteen himself, sort of view him in the lineage of sort of the uh, the working class troubadours going back to Bob Dylan and Woody Guthrie. And even even Dylan himself was sort of um, a, a moving away from the radicalism of, say, Woody Guthrie, who did directly challenge the system. So in, in that sense, Springsteen fa- arguably falls short of actually fall- uh, challenging the system. Is it that... It, you know, it sounds like Jeff thinks he's fairly progressive. Well, well, they were communists. Okay, he's not a communist. <laughs> <laughs> is he? So is he a leftist or is he just a liberal? And and are liberals incapable of challenging the system as it exists? I thought I thought that might catch your attention, Eric. Go ahead, you take that. I, I don't really. Again, I have trouble with the question. Okay, Springsteen is an artist who draws. I mean. It, I find it very interesting, the fundamental question of how he decided to become this working class hero. Mm -hmm. Because I I actually found it surprising as a teenager how how intensely, when I first heard Darkness, he went in that direction. And you can see hints of it going backwards. But that that identity was, was, did not, does not in retrospect or even today look to me like a smart commercial move. Mm-hmm. It just that's that's where he lived, and that's where he found his art. But and also he in, he he inhabited it in a in a smart commercial way. But I, I find that whole persona um, that he adapted and and become became so central to both his work and to his image uh, very intriguing and 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 kind of I don't know what the exact word is. It nobody else was doing that. Uh, rock and roll was about rebellion. In 1975, 78, there had been a few adult albums, maybe five total, uh, the most important probably being Blood on the Tracks. And yet Springsteen forged this, uh, having, having left the straightforward rebellion of uh, the first three albums into this adult, working-class, um, sort of, I'm lost in this capitalist miasma uh, Thing and and made it his own and it and I, I think it's unique and powerful and I'm wondering uh, to what degree my colleagues think it's think it was calculated or driven entirely by you know from within. Yeah, Jeff, why don't you take that first and then we'll go well, to Peter. No, I think the move from Born to Run to Darkness is so fascinating because one is such a quintessential youthful statement and the other is uh, uh, a reconciliation with adulthood or a con- you know a struggle with adulthood and that move i think you're right eric is, is is absolutely fascinating because what as a star that he had become uh after born to run he could have gone 
completely in a different direction. But he goes home, and that's not what people do. You know that the 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 car on Thunder Road circles back by 1978 and and goes to work, and that move was was absolutely crucial, I think, to who Bruce Springsteen was and who, he, you know, the, the continuity in his um, in his uh, body of work. Well, you know, it's interesting that the song um, "The Promise," which is you know a kind of eulogy um, or a mourning for for uh, the, the you know the the optimism in, in "Born to Run" and that whole story, because it ends up, as I'm sure all you guys know, with this guy, you know, that character essentially having sold his car and you know having won once, but then just been be, you know blown apart as a result. Um, that that song was actually composed for Born to Run, and I think was was ready to go, or some version of it, you know, basically at that time or very soon afterwards, that he'd seen beyond that story, you know, uh, the, the sort of the Born to Run story, and was already on the crossing over into the uh, that more adult sort of darkness on the edge of town type of. Type I thought he of wrote thing. that song during the lawsuit after Born to Run. I think it was all sort of tied in, you know, right around the same time. I, I actually, I, I take back what I said about it being ready for Born to Run. Okay. But Born to Run, I mean, one of the ideas in making that, in the course of making that record, is to begin the, the album uh, with that version of Born to Run that we know, um, and then end with this other version of it. I'm, I'm not sure if you've got, if you've heard it. Or I'm, I'm guessing maybe you did. That very sort of stripped down dark version of Born to Run, that very acoustic version where he's just singing it himself and it's essentially the same words but with a different melody it sounds like a very, one of those very sort of grim Johnny Cash songs. It's fantastic. It's a fantastic yeah, it version. is fantastic and it's basically the same song but the way he performs it is with a, you know, a voice and a you know, and and a and a darkness where you know it would have fit on it would fit quite easily on on Nebraska. Yeah, the combination of, of I mean, it seems to me he, he's so rooted in place wherever he is, mm -hmm. and that and that you know combines with the cinematographic kind of uh, uh, perspective on his stories, just makes place the you know a character in all these in all of these albums, even all the way up through the Los Angeles ones. And, um, and so, so I, I, I think somehow because he, he stayed in that area and he continued to be in contact with those people and, you know, it, to this day, as yeah. far as I understand, it, mm -hmm. it's really tremendous. People don't do that. 